So hi. Um, so yeah, talk about how crowdfunding can break the ethnic gender status quo. Uh, and by crowdfunding, I mostly mean Kickstarter. Uh, this is a talk about games. I mean, there's other sites that um, can have done good things like uh, Indiegogo. Uh, you know, Don Cheadle was able to crowdfund a movie on there, and uh, Saul Williams and his wife. Uh, like on her name a little bit right now, uh, they were able to do a film on Rocket Hub. But for games, it seems to mostly be Kickstarter. And I don't really like there being this kind of one place to go for all that, but unfortunately that's where it is. But that's uh, the one good thing about that is there's a community that, you know, looks for games. They actively want to find games there. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, first, uh, there's this one game. So Shante, as you can see, they were looking for $400,000. Uh, they got $776,000 and a lot more after that. Uh, Shante is a game by this company, Way Forward. They, were, they first made their first game in this series back in the, I think, early 2000s for the Game Boy Color. And uh, one of the interesting things about it was that it's starring like a, a belly dancer, genie lady who's darker skin. And they've had a really hard time over the last decade or so trying to pitch this game to publishers to give them money to put it out. So they've been doing a lot of contract work in order to try to, like doing like Wolverine and Thor and all these other games to try to fund this game. Uh, they've actually said that people said they would give them money if they took her off the cover. If they made something else like a person, like a dude, like the main character. So something that was interesting though was about how when Shante went up for Kickstarter, she looked like this. And this was kind of interesting to a lot of people because they were wondering why she was no longer brown. Like she went from this. And people were just like, why? People got really upset, and of, especially because the history would lead you to think it would go towards the last picture. So people complained, people who were fans of their company complained, people who just were like me. I mean, I, I like their games, but I was more like, why is she not a brown skin lady anymore? And, you know, sites even covered it. And they actually came out and said, hey, you know what? We're going to fix this. So they did. They kind of stepped around it a little bit. But they, they citing that it was like a skin shader technology or something. But, <laughs> but they changed it. So it's good. It's, I mean, the thing is, is they have lots of men and women of a lot of different backgrounds that work there. Um, so they really were, were believing in this and the fact that their fans and other people were criticizing it. Uh, the fact that they took the stance and said, hey, we're going to fix it, that's like a great example. Another game that uh, was looking for funding uh, was La Mulana 2, which was the sequel to the first one, which was starring a guy. Uh, the second one they prominently featured that it was going to star a lady. Uh, 66000 over their goal that they were looking for from a Japanese designer. And this was actually kind of interesting because the, one of the bigger publishers, Capcom at the time, had just you know announced a new game that was called Deep Down, that's about uh, ninths or whatever. And they were announced that they were specifically not going to have female character models in it because there wasn't a market. And it's kind of interesting because I mentioned this on Twitter about how La Mulana 2 and Shantae had both reached, exceeded their goals. So clearly there are fans who want to see this. And actually I became friends with the players and the company that's working on this through that because like the internet also agreed, like yes, we want women in our games. So those are, I guess, a little bit bigger uh, success stories. Uh, so this is uh, kind of, this is an interesting game. Uh, the game itself kind of looks like kind of very, you know, very video gaming. But the interesting thing is, is I mean, they were looking for 40 grand, 48 grand, they hit 59, and they are a team out of Indonesia. And that's pretty amazing to see that, you know, a team from an area that you don't normally see being a part of the independent game scene, making you know making their own way there. So uh, now we have a uh, Super Combo Man, a game that actually just came out. Uh, this was run by my friend Justin Woodward, who uh, runs in Bang Entertainment. This was actually the second Kickstarter. This was a while. This was a bit before Kickstarters were hitting the hundreds of thousands to millions for video games. His first one asked for 15,000, his second one asked for 14, nine, and he exceeded it. Uh, and the, it's interesting because 
Um, he actually, they just released the game and clearly the $16,000 was not enough to last from 2012 until 2014. So he actually had to, you know, actively work very hard to find uh, funding after the fact. But the fact that he really believed in the project and that this was able to be an actual, you know, starting point for him to actually fund the game is pretty interesting. I mean, Justin's a black gentleman. Uh, also, and also the funny thing is the game stars an overweight black guy with a mullet with a fanny pack who just wants to be like his uh, hero, Super Combo Man, who's a, like a white dude who's a fighting game character. And it's kind of interesting because it's like, that's, that's like the black community's like view of fighting games, right? It's you're always chasing, like you want to be that character. <laughs> and the fact that it's a game starring a minority, like made by a dude who just wanted to make what he wanted was pretty interesting that he, he was able to, and he, I think today, in today's uh, environment, he'd be able to have gotten a lot more money for that. Another title is a Centris. Centris is a musical game by uh, Samantha Kalman. Uh, she launched this in uh, November, in November 2013, and it's, it's interesting because it's a game made by a lady, a music game that's also a very niche title, and she was able to exceed her budget by a bit. It also just got released on Steam Greenlight, and she was up, and via Kickstarter was able to uh, attract like a lot of a lot of people who really wanted to see this made, like a, the creative director at uh, Harmonix, which is another big uh, music making company. Uh, they made like Guitar Hero initially and Rock Band. Uh, he, you know, helped fund the game, and so otherwise, you know, how tr how to try to find that funding would have been kind of almost impossible, especially because this game in itself is a very niche game. It's about actually like Guitar Hero is a game that was popular because people really liked to see how hard it was, and Centris is a game that's made for anybody to be able to learn how to just have fun with and make music. Catacomb Kids game uh, that was looking for 20 grand and it ended up hitting 30. And it was made by another friend of mine, Tyreek. I have a lot of friends that made Kickstarters. I actually actively tried to seek them out uh, just because they were all very bright people. And it was actually really interesting. Like his Kickstarter kind of, kind of came out of nowhere. It came out in December of 2013. And that's a time where, you know, Christmas is coming, games, big games were already launched. Like people are pretty much exhausted money wise. But he was able to. You know, use a lot of uh, viral marketing by posting little videos of him discussing how to play the game and all the like. The game is about trying to make everything a thing that can be used. So a rock can you think a rock? If you throw a rock at someone, will hurt them. If you throw it in like hot fire, if you throw it in fire, it'll heat it up. If you throw that warm stone into water, it will make it boil. So he just did this a bunch of videos like this, and this is pretty much what pushed it over. Tyreek being a you know black gentleman, it's pretty interesting to see that you were able to find uh, funding that way. Another game that was funded, that was funding around the same time actually. Uh, these French fries are terrible hot dogs. It's Jean Pierre. Um, he was looking for four thousand dollars, and he hit nineteen thousand, almost twenty thousand for a card game that is all about deception and. It's kind of interesting because, like, this is again at the time where you wouldn't think that. And also, it's a game that has a very small premise, but he was able to, you know, take that and turn that into something. And he constantly keeps sending out updates. Uh, Sean's a very smart guy who actually, you know, is up for an award at Indicate this year. Uh, okay, so and then then comes to me, like, I just. Actually, I spent about two and a half months running a Kickstarter this year. Uh, my first one, they were both for my game Treachery and Beatdown City. Uh, the first one hit 21,000 out of 50, and the second one went to 50 out of 49. And it's kind of interesting because a big aspect of my game was uh, that the characters are diverse. Like it's a Puerto Rican lady, a Mexican dude, and a, a Jamaican guy uh, kind of trying to make a game that actually actively, it's a kind of a niche brawler slash tactics game that has a bit of, but then also has a lot of commentary because it's about the city and it's about me growing up and it's about me dealing with people and you know assumptions and gentrification, a lot of that. And it actually kind of plays out interestingly in the game. But 
trying to trying to tell this to people is kind of interesting, and I I always had to think about like who to pitch the diversity angle to, and so I pitched it to Joystick at one point, and they wrote a really nice article about it. But then you know you dig through the comments, and the last comments that I ever really dealt with were this guy uh, who says uh, Josh TX is a you know is a white father of two mixed children, um, and he and he keeps talking about his wife's culture, and I don't really know what this means. So I ask, and he says his wife is African American, and I think to myself that's not really a culture, but. Um, and then he mentions that her family is very far from the stereotypical uh, problems that plague black America. And keeps talking about how he doesn't understand why representation in games is important. And I just had to walk, like I was trying to actively be a part of the comments and uh, I just had to walk away at that point. So it was just kind of interesting. Uh, but I, one thing I meant, actually meant to put in this, but I didn't, was that another comment was saying, man, I don't know what I like more, the brown people in the game or the fact that people are hating on this, yeah. consider this backed. And then another guy was like, oh, cool, like backing out of like, uh, like indignation, like righteous indignation, that's cool. <laughs> okay, so earlier this year also, we had uh, Sunset, which is uh, made by Tale of Tales, which also, um, uh, one half is uh, Aria Harvey, who's a black lady who uh, keynoted Indicate East this year. And you know, they were looking for 25, they hit 67. They are kind of a pretty well-known group of people who making games, but the interesting thing was that it's a game starring a black lady and that they were able to get so much support for it. Uh, they usually reach out for grants for these things. So then moving, I guess, a little bit away from uh, gender and race, uh, we moved to GamerCon, which, you know, years ago was looking for 25 grand to do, put on a LGBT-focused uh, games convention. They were looking for 25, they hit 91, and they had their first event. And that's pretty amazing because, like, you can see that going on Kickstarter was able to, you know, help fund a cultural institution. They moved on to GamerX2, and, you know, I think they were expecting to hit like way more, but they pretty much, you know, only hit 25 about. And this year they started, they ran into the issue where it actually ended up being bigger than the first one. But then they weren't able to get enough sponsorship and the ticket sales at the front were a lot lower. So they ended up about 85 grand in the hole because of a lot of things. And they went out on Twitter and they said, hey, like, we are kind of screwed, like we don't know if we can bring this back. And a lot of developers and publishers said, hey, we'll, we'll kick in this much, we'll kick in like three grand each if uh, other people will match. So then, so then this year they, they said, okay, well we're gonna go with that and people really want this to come back. And so then they hit, you know, they went for like their original real goal, and they hit you know ninety eight thousand, and they're doing uh, game dev workshops and stuff that they're going to do on top of that. And it's interesting because they were able to they, you can see an ebb and flow of their three accounts. Where the second one they might not have uh, people didn't feel like it belonged in their life as much as they wanted it to be. But when they had the risk, there were a lot of news stories that were saying they were not going to do it again. So then they said, hey, no, we'll help. And so, I mean, I, I put in 400 for like a sponsor table or whatever, because, you know, before, and they, they're an organization that uh, has gone after trying to diversify the LGBTQ like, community in terms of the fact that even calling it GamerX, like they called it GX3, everyone games, because the, 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 the main guy, Matt, he was saying, when I think gamer, like I think like cis white man, and that's clearly not what's here. And what was interesting was like GamerX had a large amount of black people, a lot of large amount of like uh, handicapped people, a lot of large amount of people that you don't normally see at games conventions. So the fact that everybody thought this was so important and that they were able to, you know, leverage Kickstarter a third time even to go for real mounts that will probably be backed. That were it's pretty much the understanding that other companies were going to back to maybe double this amount. So another uh, another Kickstarter uh, 
Moon Hunters. Uh, this was interesting because uh, the lady who runs this company, Tanya Short, she is, you know, front and center in this video. Um, and so it, you know, it did extremely well. It was a lot of marketing uh, pre beforehand, but they were able to well exceed their goal. Like they wanted 45, hit almost 180 grand. Um, Pumpkin was an interesting one because I didn't really personally like the uh, amount they were asking for because they want an online game and online games take millions of dollars and then get folded, right? Like, but you know they were asking for thirty grand, but the big thing that they were asking, what they were saying is like, you know, they like front and center. It's a black lady running the campaign. It's like. Um, Love that is non-discriminatory about there's no binaries in that men and women both wear the same clothes, whatever, they don't care. And I I didn't, you know, I didn't uh, I tried to promote it as much as I could because I thought it was important. I thought it needed to exist. I wanted to see that and they got they succeeded, so that's really awesome. So now we're gonna go into a bit of a dark side of because you know it's interesting, like over the last few years I've seen a lot of great Kickstarters that have Pretty much shown that women of color, men of color, from different uh, that the LGBT community can all kind of come together and, you know, through a lot of hard work, it's a tremendous amount of hard work can fund their dream projects or their first or second projects through Kickstarter. But what happens when you market specifically only to the status quo? And so then there was Mighty Number no. Nine, which you know they wanted nine hundred thousand for, well exceeded it. And this is by the uh, Keiji Inafune, who was the who is credited often, but didn't actually create Mega Man. And Mega Man, you know, Mega Man's like 30 years old. Like it's this amazing property that has some of the most obsessive fans on the planet. And you know, everything was going good until they announced that this lady Dina was going to be the community manager, and people started getting really upset. Um, she, by because she would suggest things like maybe you should have some female robots. Like people are like, what, is, what do you mean she's gonna she's gonna ruin my game? Like, and I mean, there's a video called Mighty Number no. Nope that's called the Great Great Dina Disaster, and in it, like this video deals with like blog posts where this guy is talking about how oh she's a community manager but she shouldn't be. Oh, he's they say. At least we know the community, he slash she slash he she, the quality he is dealing with. So they're getting kind of sarcastic about the fact that people, you know, want things like preferred pronouns to be important. And so, I mean, and, and this video goes on and talks about how, like, it can't be so bad because she's just a feminist, but maybe she's not, like, talking about preferred pronouns and then brings up this tweet where she's talking about preferred pronouns. Like, it's a bad thing. And it's kind of weird because. You're just seeing that the status quo is upset that this game is having somebody who may not be like because they actually complain about the fact that it's now no longer only being worked on by veteran Japanese developers and are calling everything about her life into like they're saying why did she get her job oh because her boyfriend works there blah 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 I'm like we all know that the tech community and the game community like that's how you get jobs you know people you're friends with people. But because she dares to challenge that what this game is about, that for some reason the nepotism that helped her a little bit, like that, you know, uh, I guess far in a way exceeds the amount of institutional sexism <laughs> that keeps women down. And it's it's all because of this this sketch. People were really upset by the sketch. Like uh, they they were like they're gonna turn the main character into a woman. Uh, blah blah blah. Like. Like, she's gonna ruin the whole game with her feminist ideas. So, I mean, it's really great that you're able to find success and break the status quo, but, I mean, it's also very dangerous if you only go for the status quo. Thank you.